ABC, it's Mike here. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who commented on my first ever video. I actually made a few new friends, too. That's nice. Um, this time around, I'm just going to show maybe five or six CDs I've been listening to for the past few months. Maybe three months, two months. Uh, the first band I'm going to show is a band called Soviet France. Um, the name originally, they used the letter S, then they switched to the letter Z. So you might see some early stuff, maybe on cassette or vinyl, with the S Soviet spelling. Um, but basically they used Soviet France with a Z throughout most of, of their uh, recording history. Um, the album I'm going to show is from 1986. It was on their own label called Red Rhino Records. Uh, the reissue I have is on a label called Charm. It was reissued in 1997. That's when I picked it up. Used. Um, great album cover. That's the front cover. Back cover. Some nice inside artwork also. No real liner notes to speak of. Just the song titles. A few humorous things on here. Uh, the back says, Warning, contents include materials of European origin. Uh, this album has some music trivia attached to it. Um, and some historical attachments also uh the title misfits Looney tunes and squally criminals came from ronald reagan evidently uh there was a uh incident of an airplane hijacking i think it started in greece it was a twa passenger airline it was hijacked by terrorists um the music trivia part of the thing was one of the passengers was the singer of the group called Aphrodite's Child. I believe his name is Demi Roussos. Uh, the Greek government actually negotiated and he was let off the plane, so he survived this ordeal. Um, one of the songs called They Are Eating the Passengers features actual transmission, radio transmissions between the pilot of the plane and the uh, air control tower. Um, this this band was lumped in with uh, either industrial, in, either in the industrial category or the dark ambient um, category. I put them somewhere in between. Um, they have elements similar to Cabaret Voltaire, Although Cabaret Voltaire tends most to have more of a funk based a lot of this stuff, uh, except maybe the album Red Mecca, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, they're not as braced as abrasive as Robin Gristle's earlier stuff, uh, but they, you know they're, they're pretty unique. Uh, they're, they're from England. Um, they changed membership throughout the years. The uh, only two guys I believe were constants were uh, Robin Story. And Mike, Mark Spivey, uh, Robin Story went on to um, use the moniker Rapoon, R-A-P-O-O-N. Uh, he recorded some solo stuff under that name. Uh, Soviet France used uh, a lot of treated instruments, treated piano. Everything had, had a, a, a treatment to it. It wasn't a straight uh, instrument. Whether it was a piano, like I said, pianos, treat, a treated piano, treated flutes. Uh, there was always some kind of loop involved. Um, real drums, fake drums, uh, you know, electric drums, uh, tape loops, um, found sounds, found voices. Uh, really an interesting, uh, you know, brew of different uh, sound elements. Combined it to a nice 
really different kind of sound. Um, I can say this much, uh, maybe three months ago, there was a vinyl reissue, a box set of all our stuff in the 1980s, which is the classic period. Unfortunately, it's probably sold out. Um, even CDs like this are pretty hard to find. This is the only CD I have by them. I've been looking a lot of, you know, quite a bit. Um, you know, hopefully they, they reissue the vinyl again. Uh, as the box set, or individually, or hopefully again on um, compact disc. Um, Rapun, um, I think he does some stuff on Soleil, the Soleil Moon label, and I think Soviet France also did one or two albums on the Soleil Moon label, um, maybe in the early, late 90s. Um, but I think... Um, you know, they're, they're, they're underappreciated. Um, if you check them out, they, they'll really appeal to a lot of different kind of people. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, uh, you know, like really, like I said, they're not industrial uh, at, to me at all. Um, you know, but I can, you, you would think of them as dark ambient, like bands, uh, this band called Oyuki Conjugate. Uh, they kind of sound like them. Uh but you know, like a little bit of like you know the classic like talk talk stuff like Spirit of Eden, a little bit of, in, in line with that stuff too. Um, the next thing I'm going to show is a that beautiful Robin Wyatt compilation called "Different Every Time." The uh, cool thing about this, um, my girlfriend Cindy, you know, grinds her own coffee beans every morning, makes great coffee. Uh, one morning, I was listening to this album, and she handed me my cup of coffee, and she said, I hope it's good, because it comes out different every time. That's the title of the album I was listening to. Uh, I'm a big fan of Robin Wyatt, uh, with Soft Machine, uh, Matching Mole, the solo stuff. Uh, this compilation is worth owning because of the second CD. Uh, it's, it's titled Benign Dictatorships. It features Robert's work with other artists. He's a guest vocalist, basically, um, with maybe, was it 20 tracks? So 17 tracks on the second side. Um, fantastic stuff. Um, you know, I think everybody likes Robert Wyatt. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say they don't like Robert Wyatt. Um, you know, people love Soft Machine. Uh, they, they might not really know his solo stuff. Um, my favorite solo song by him is on here. It's called The Age of Self. Perfect song. Um, I think it's on the album called Old Rotten Hat. But um, that's one of my favorite songs by him. My favorite songs of all time. Uh, they stay away from his classic Rock Bottom album. Well, they didn't really stay away from it uh, completely. They don't have any studio versions of the songs in the album, but they do have a live version of the song called A Last Straw. Uh, it was recorded from 1974, I believe. You know, it's different hearing a, a live version, so it's worth, you know, hearing it just for that one particular song. Um, the second CD, though, is uh, really interesting to me. Um, most of the people on here I've never heard of. Some people, I, uh, you know, big names, but I didn't realize that Robert Wyatt worked with them. Um, some particular favorites of mine on the second CD, uh, he does a great version of a song by John Cage. John Cage uh, isn't really known that well for his songs, uh, but he does some great stuff in that uh category uh this song is called experiences number two it's based on uh, the text is based on a poem owned by e. e cummings so it's a piece for solo voice robert wyatt really nails it good on that one um beautiful beautiful piece um i think that came from um, this song came from a, a brian eno um album on the obscure label I'm not sure which one, but it's interesting to hear Robert 
why just solo without any instruments? Uh, I don't think I've ever heard him in that context other than this particular song. Um, some other highlights for me are he did a piece with Phil Manzanera called Frontera. That might be from Phil's Diamond Head album. I'm a huge fan of Roxy Music and uh, Phil Manzanera's guitar playing, but for some reason, I've never owned any of Phil's solo albums. Um, I'm going to remember that situation. Another favorite is um, a song called We Will Win. Uh, it's done with a band called Working Week. It's, I believe it's maybe a, a, a protest song, uh, maybe from Chile or Venezuela. Some Latin American type thing. Um, the band Working Week, uh, the only person I know in that band is a saxophone player named Larry Stabens. I actually have a great album, a live album he did with Keith Tippett and the drummer Louis Moholo. Fantastic live recording. Uh, and for you ECM nuts, there's a piece that Robert sings with Jan Gabarik's daughter, Anya Gabarik, which I never knew he had a daughter who was a musician. A great song called The Diver. Uh, one of the other songs that really gets me is um, with a, a, a band called Grass Cut. The song is called Richardson Road. Beautiful song. Um, some of the people that I, I know... Uh, Bjork, he does a song called Submarine with her. Uh, and he does some work with uh, Michael Mantler um, from the you know, Watt slash ECM label. Um, one of the songs, Sinking Spell, I believe was uh, written around the text of uh, Edwin Gorey. That, that's a really good one. Um, of course, the uh, one of the standout tracks is Robert Wyatt's version of Elvis Costello's song, Shipbuilding. I've never heard uh, Elvis Costello's version. Uh, I'd like to, but I'm sure Robert Wyatt's version is a lot better. Um, so this, this would appeal to um, Robert Wyatt completists. And if anybody wants to dip their toes into Robert's, Robert Wyatt's ocean, uh, this is a great place to start. This um, title, Different Every Time, is also the title of a, a biography that came out uh, simultaneously with this CD. It's also on vinyl, I believe. That's hard to see because of reflection. Uh, this is probably... My favorite piece of music that I've heard in months. Um, I was in a thrift store. I gathered about 25 CDs. I was walking from the small back room where the CDs are to the cash register. And something made me go back in that room and I found this. I paid $1 for this, folks. It's uh, an oud player. Rupin Alti Parmakian. He was born in Turkey, uh, but moved to Greece when he was a child. Uh, roughly right around the time of World War II, he had to interrupt his music studies, you know, due to the war. So he spent, uh, he hid out from the war in small Greek villages, uh, earning a living by playing the violin. So he's an oud player. He's also an excellent violinist. He was actually in, uh, he made some cameo appearances in Greek movies, playing the violin. Um, he's not well known here, but maybe in Greece, in Armenia, and Turkey, people know who this guy is. Uh, these are home recordings that were re released by his family in 2000, the year 2000. Not even sure when he died, um, but it's great stuff. Um, some of the uh, songs include uh, keyboard, like there's three or four songs that in include keyboards 
guitar, bass. Um, they they sound you know like wedding type songs or uh, you know party type songs. They're really good, uh, but not essential. The rest of the stuff is uh, Rupin uh, singing along with his oud improvisations or just solo in, uh, oud improvisations without vocals. Um, I usually prefer oud music uh, from the Fertile Crescent area of the world, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Morocco. Um, you know, oud music is widespread. It's in Armenia, Greece. That's, this stuff is usually good, but uh, to me, the, the real oud music uh, hot spots or power spots are always still from the Fertile Crescent area. Uh, and this guy went to New York City, probably in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, he actually made a, uh, an album with an Armenian American singer, and they had one hit song, maybe. Um, trying to find that too. Uh, he played a lot in like restaurants, like Middle East and Turkish, Lebanese, Greek restaurants in New York City. Um, and before that, the interesting thing too is while he was still in, in uh, uh, Greece, he actually played for the French Rothschilds on their yachts in the Mediterranean. So, um, you know, he, he might be well known in other parts of the world, but unfortunately in America, um, I haven't encountered anybody who knows who this guy is. Um, he really gets uh, his voice is like a, a deep, uh, you know, baritone type voice. Um, you can tell by the picture, he looks like a, like a, like a longshoreman type guy, um, smoking a cigarette while he plays. Um, yeah, so this, his, uh, family put this out. It's called, uh, Armenian Kef Songs. There's, there's another thing called, uh, Armenian Love Songs that they put out. And the other one's called, uh, The Lost Treasures. I want to get both of those also. Um, so if anybody knows more about this guy, I'd love to hear about it. This great album is by a band called the No Neck Blues Band. Don't let the name fool you. They have nothing to do with the blues at all. That's the front cover. The rear cover. All their albums feature this type of homemade art. It reminds me somewhat of some early Saturn records from Sun Ra. Uh, this album is called Live at Ken's Electric Lake. Uh, there's no liner notes at all on this. Um, most of the albums, as you notice, there's not even a, a band name on it. I've never seen all the albums I have by them. You never find any information at all about the personnel or even the, the band name itself is never on their album. So it's very difficult without a sticker on it to even know what the stuff is. Um, usually I don't bother when bands do something like this, but this band is so good that I do extra work and track their stuff down. Uh, they were John Fahey's favorite band. John Fahey doesn't throw bouquets at people, so when John Fahey said they're his favorite band, that's uh, something that you should uh, listen to, um, take his advice. He actually had them record um, a studio album called Sticks and Stones May Break My Bones on his Revenant label. Uh, Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth uh, loves his band. He calls them the greatest rock and roll band ever. Uh, Thurston Moore is more like me, engages in hyperbole, unlike John Fahey. 
But um, yeah, it's good, good stuff. Um, again, this categories they call this type of music New Wear in America. They came out in like '92, I think it was their first album. Um, they really don't fit into that category. Um, they're more like a commune type band, like Amandul, not Amandul Two, but the original commune Amandul. Uh, that type of band. There's probably between seven and nine permanent members of this band. So anytime you have a a band of that many people, um, you know, not, you know, playing different types of instruments, not a jazz band or an orchestra, it, it, it's going to have a commune type feel to it. To me, anyway, my experience. Um, that's the part I really love about this band. Um, a great thing about this band is that there's no virtuosos in it, and they don't claim to be. Um, and they all play percussion. Percussion is a big, big part of all their music. All their albums sound different, but they all focus on percussion, hand percussion. No uh, trap drums to speak of. Um, they play a lot of, you know, hand percussion like metal, wood chimes, anything like that. Um, their uh, use of percussion reminds me of uh, the art ensemble of Chicago's use of, they call them small instruments, uh, that type of sound, which is very, very intriguing. Um, they do that well. Uh, this album in particular features a lot of uh, electric guitar playing. Some albums don't. Some albums may focus more on organ or saxophone or more homemade electronic sounds. This has a little bit of homemade electronic sounds, but it's it's not really the focus. It's the hand percussion and the guitars. Um, there's some caveman style chanting, moaning, uh, flute playing, of course, some trumpet playing. Um, there might be some guests from the, from the band called Sunburn Hand of the Man. Uh, they, they're under a different moniker called The Clare People and Mystery Gypped on this. Uh, somebody told me that that's, it was them, so I'll take their word for it. Um, allegedly, this was recorded live around a lake in Canada. I've seen some YouTube video uh, showing the performance, maybe an eight-minute clip. So this is one long, continuous piece of... Uh, it's got a ceremonial, of course, tribal feel to it. Um, the great thing about this band is they start off with this random sound of percussive jams, and they slowly work themselves into a beautiful trance-inducing rhythmic pattern. Um, they'll stay with that pattern for a while. That will dissolve, and they'll come back into something else later, another trance inducing rhythm pattern that's different than the first one. Then they, then they start to meander around again. And they'll come back again with another trance-inducing rhythm pattern, which is really, I love that style of music. Um, and you can't say they sound Middle Eastern or African. Somehow they create their own unique rhythm patterns that are really, really cool. Um, the first time I bought this out, the, when I first bought this album, uh, I just opened it up, put it in my car, compact disc player, and listened to it without opening up the Gatefold album itself. Uh, the first few minutes reminded me of uh, the Allman Brothers with Dickie Betts in particular, his guitar playing on a song like, like a mountain jam type song of that noodly kind of guitar. That Dickie Best was, you know, uh, known for, uh, either with uh, Dwayne Allman or Warren Haynes, both uh, setups they did stuff like that together. Uh, and the cool thing is, when I got home, I opened up the album cover, and I found this. This photo right here is a, either a homage or a satire of the first Allman Brothers album, which includes a similar photo of the Allman Brothers 
Um, the Almond Brothers photo caused a big scene. People call it a nude photo. Um, they have the clothes off, but you know the private parts aren't shown. So I guess you know that was enough to get people riled up. So I thought it was pretty cool that to me it sounded like Dicky Betts. Uh, and remember though, this is not blues music, so maybe it's just me that he hears that. But this album photo kind of confirms that I'm right about that. Um, their other stuff is on their own label, Sound at One. Um, they had a, a, a few albums on some smaller labels um, that I'll talk about in later videos, actually. Uh, but they're really, really interesting. No Neck Blues Band. They're from New York City, Harlem. They have a, a performance space called the Hint House. Um, they perform, or I don't know if they still do, but they perform live concerts on the rooftop inside the uh, performance space, you know, usually for free. Um, they would pay, play in subways and in um, parks in New York City. And the cool thing about, another great thing about this band is no matter what style of music they do, you always feel like you're in the loft seat of New York City. They, they, they always uh, retain the sign of New York City, no matter what style of music that they do, which I find pretty magical.